Hello class, welcome to Criminology the Core. This is chapter two, the nature and extent of crime. The first thing we're gonna discuss are the primary sources of crime data. They primarily come from the Uniform Crime Report. Part one crimes are violent crimes. Part two of the Uniform Crime Report are any other crimes. Arrest data from police departments and clearance rates are also included. And the main problem, however, with the Uniform Crime Report is the validity of data. The primary sources of crime data are surveys and official records, of which the Uniform Crime Report is one. The National Incident-Based Reporting System, also known as NIBRS, is the future of the Uniform Crime Report. It is an improvement over the standard UCR, or Uniform Crime Report. It contains 46 specific offenses, 11 lesser offenses. It also includes incident, victim, and offender information and 6,250 law enforcement agencies all submit data. Now, here's a discussion activity for you. Read the section of your text on UCR and NIBRS and think about the following questions. What are the shortcomings of the UCR? And then what advantages does NIBRS have compared to the UCR? As far as the survey research that's conducted, people are asked about attitudes, beliefs, values, characteristics, and experiences with crime and victimization. There's a fairly large sampling over a large section of the population that's been affected by experience with crime and victimization. The National Crime Victimization Survey, or the NCVS, is a nationwide survey of more than 90,000 households across the United States. It collects information about crimes suffered. There are some potential problems such as over-reporting due to the victim's misinterpretation of events and under-reporting due to embarrassment of reporting crime, fear of getting into trouble, or sometimes forgetting the incident or portions of the incident. There's also an inability to record the personal criminal activity of those interviewed as well as sampling errors, which occur in every type of survey. And there is also a problem with inadequate question format that can invalidate responses. The question ultimately has to be asked then, what is the validity of the NCVS? There are self-report surveys, and these are often given in groups. They are anonymous and ask people to describe recent and lifetime participation in criminal activity. As far as the validity of self-reports, there can be an issue with the honesty of self-reporting participants. As far as monitoring the future, there is also the problem with consistency in terms of monitoring. I mentioned there being some issue about the integrity and honesty of people reporting crimes or their involvement in crimes. And this is table 2.1 which is titled Monitoring the Future Survey of Criminal Activity of High School Seniors. Not all high school seniors are going to be 
straightforward and perfectly honest about activity that they might have participated in even though it is anonymous and you can see here it's mostly reliable and you can see here along the left column you see the type of delinquency in the center column whether or not it was committed at least once and on the right hand column whether or not it was committed more than once so it does help spot trends uh, but again there is always a little bit of ambiguity in terms of how honest the respondents are going to be whether it's anonymous or not in terms of evaluating crime data even though the tallies of crime are from different surveys and are not in sync, the crime patterns, rates, and trends are similar. But bear in mind that all data sources have weaknesses. Crime data are reliable indicators of changes and fluctuations in yearly crime rates. I mentioned some of the weaknesses involved in evaluating crime data and as far as the UCR is concerned one problem is that it does not include unreported crimes and it is subject to reporting caprices of police departments so the police may or may not participate in a UCR as far as the NCVS is concerned it is made up of estimates from limited samples of population and it also consists of personal recollections which are not always completely accurate it also does not include homicide or drug abuse crimes and then I mentioned about self-report surveys and how they rely on the honesty of offenders and even though I mentioned that these are anonymous, there still tends to be an element of distrust. So offenders may not always be honest. This table shows the primary sources of crime data as collected by the Uniform Crime Report the National Incident-Based Reporting System, the National Crime Victimization Survey, and Self-Report Surveys. You need to take a look at this table and familiarize yourself with the different methods that are used to collect this data. Here's an activity for you to do. Look at Table 2.1 in your text and analyze the information in the table and ask yourself the following questions. Which types of delinquency are committed the most often? Next question, which type of delinquency has the highest probability of having been committed more than once? Also, which type of delinquency is committed the least often? And finally, why do you think some types of delinquency are more likely to be committed repeatedly? Now let's take a look at crime trends. As far as contemporary trends are concerned, crime rates peaked in 1991, and since 1991, crime rates have decreased from 15 million to 9.2 million in 2015. There's a significant drop in UCR violent crimes, and also property crimes have decreased. As far as trends in victimization, victimizations have declined significantly in the past 30 years, and violent victimization has especially declined by 80% since 1993. As far as what the future holds, there have been recent spikes in murder rates in several major cities. 
crime rates may rise in the future because of globalization and income inequality. And technology itself creates new crimes as well. There's also an increase in numbers of elementary school age children, which may lead to future increase in crime as children reach teenage and young adult age. Conversely, the rising number of senior citizens could lead to lower crime rates. There are some societal factors that help explain some of the trends in crime rates. The age structure, in other words, our population in general is aging. Immigration, economy and jobs, or the availability of jobs and the economy in general. Abortion, gun availability, gang membership, drug use, and internet crimes. Some other factors that help explain trends in crime rates are the media. It's more and more available 24 hours a day. Increases in medical technology, aggressive law enforcement, incarceration or greater numbers of incarceration, and overall cultural changes. Let's talk about crime patterns. The ecology of crime. This involves day, season, and climate. Most reported crimes occur during summer months. Also, as far as temperature is concerned, weather effects may have an impact on violent crime rates. And there are regional differences as well. Large urban areas have higher rates of violence in general. Continuing with crime patterns, you also have co-offending in crime. Crime tends to be a group activity, and adolescents are particularly likely to commit crime in groups. Co-offending occurs in neighborhoods that are less disadvantaged, more stable, and contain more people who can be trusted. Gender and crime also play a role. While male crime rates are much higher than female crime rates, but while male arrest rates have declined in general, female arrest rates have been more stable and have increased for some crimes. Early criminologists pointed to emotional, physical, and psychological trait differences between males and females to explain crime rate differences. Girls are socialized to be less aggressive, while boys are taught to be more aggressive. Girls are superior to boys in verbal ability, while boys test higher in visual spatial performance. Liberal feminist theory suggests that lower crime rates for women is caused by their quote unquote second class economic and social position. Then there's race and crime. African Americans make up only 13% of the population, but account for 40% of arrests for part one violent crimes and 25% of property crime arrests. One explanation is institutional racism. One aspect of that is the racial threat theory. In other words, just because someone's African American they're incorrectly perceived as a threat and racial profiling falls under the same thinking. Another explanation is structural racism. Crime is the byproduct of social conditions such as poverty. Now let's look at the use of firearms. Firearms are involved in 20% of robberies, 10% of assaults, and more than 5% of rapes. Kleck suggests that guns also prevent crimes and save lives. You need to read about this a little more closely in your text. About 70% of murders involve a firearm. 
So there is an ongoing debate about gun control in this country. Not the possession of guns, but the control of guns and the types of weapons that are available. Now let's talk about social class and crime. There's instrumental crime. These are illegal acts whose goal is to provide desired goods and services that can't be obtained through legitimate economic means. Then there are expressive crimes. These are crimes that are the result of frustration and anger. There's also unemployment and crime. Unemployment is linked to higher crime rates. Conflicting research shows crime rates sometimes rise during periods of high employment and falls during unemployment. That seems paradoxical, but it happens. Full employment means kids with jobs can spend money and engage in antisocial activities like drinking and drug abuse or drug use. Then there's age and crime. Age is inversely related to criminality. In other words, the older someone gets, the less likely they are to commit crime. Also, most teenagers eventually age out of crime as well. As they get older, they become more mature, their brains mature, and they tend to literally age out of crime. Now here's a question for you to consider. From your perspective as a student, why are teenagers more likely to commit crimes? And another question is, what is the aging out effect? Persistent offenders are called chronic offenders or career criminals. There was a book written called Delinquency in a Birth Cohort, written by Wolfgang Figlio and Selen. It was a classic longitudinal study that tracked a cohort of boys over an 18 year period. Now, what causes chronicity? One is an early onset. The earlier that one is exposed to violence and crime, the more likely they are to become a chronic offender. And the implications of a chronic offender concept result in mandatory sentences, three strike policies, and truth in sentencing policies. Okay, class. That's it for chapter two. Thank you again, as always, for your time. Please make sure that you look at the tables and please make sure that you read the suggested reading that we've talked about in this presentation. Make sure to rely on your text as your primary source of information and anything that you find of interest or that's relevant to anything that we've talked about in this chapter, please research it and read about it. As always, thank you for your time. It's always appreciated and we will see you next class.